And this legacy of LQC would go on to influence the US presidency. There are very few of the great dictators left. All the best ones are now gone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your revered leader, Simon Wammers here. One of my writers, Danny, in this case. Thank you, Danny. Writes me a script. Famous dictators. Excuse me. Who are actually really nice guys. Dictators. Don't we love them? <laughs> well, let's just jump in. Democracy could be a proper pain in the parliamentary posterior. If I was given the choice of another four years of democratic rule in the UK or dictatorship unrestrained by such trivial matters such as law or constitution, I'd have to give it some serious thought. I have to say, like, you know, the uh, benevolent dictator thing, like the dictator who actually wants something good is one of the most effective forms of governance, right? Because it's like, there's no checks and balances. There's just like, there's one guy at the top, like Singapore. What was his name? The, the guy who ran Singapore for like decades. It's like proper benevolent dictator, right? Who just made Singapore from like this like backwater into like the richest place in Asia. It's kind of mental. They love me. I mean, I suppose it depends who we'd end up with as dictator. For example, a Piers Morgan. It's Morgan time. For example, a Piers Morgan dictatorship would be proper rubbish. But I reckon somebody a bit more reasonable, like Stephen Fry, might turn out to be quite a jolly good dictator. In fact, considering the shower of shit that makes up the current British government, who have to keep reminding each other which one of them is supposed to be prime minister next week. It is crazy. There are so many prime ministers. They're just in and out. Bring me Piers Morgan! I'd be happy to have Dick Van Dyke installed as dictator at this point. There's a man who knows his onions. Yes, he's American, but I reckon nobody would even notice or care as long as he conducted all of his public speaking in the authentic Cockney accent of Bert the Chimney Sweep from Mary Poppins. This is sarcasm, right? Wasn't his accent famously bad? I haven't seen Mary Poppins since I was a kid. I have seen it, though, because it's Mary Poppins. Of course, I'm largely joking, Dick Van Dyke would never get away with it, but when you think about all of the problems with democracy, the constant political instability, and the fact that it takes ages to get the simplest thing past the stale rituals of parliaments or congress, it's tempting to conclude that dictatorship is far more efficient. It would need to be a benevolent dictatorship, of course, one in which the dictator rules fairly for the benefit of everyone, rather than just building himself more palaces while leaving the population to starve. <laughs> <laughs> and executing any dissenters. I'd be the latter dictator. I'd be like, I wonder how many palaces is too many. Only one way to find out. And then people would be like, Simon, do you think you have enough palaces? And I'll be like, do you think you have enough heads? Because uh, you, I'm chopping him off. I'm chopping the one you have off and you don't have a spare. Let's get it done. I'm going to cut off your head now. Good enough. The problem is that benevolent dictators are hard to come by these days. This wasn't always the case. We'll travel back to the good old days of original dictators of ancient Rome in just a moment. But whilst the ruthless actions of a long line of infamous dictators since then... Danny, how long is this introduction? I feel like every few months, I just have to be like, Danny, <laughs> Danny, what happens? Danny, Danny. And then Danny will lay off the introduction. So I'm just going to adjust this lighting. Danny will... Oh. Daniel lay off the introductions for a little while and then we come back and it's like oh, three minutes 21 so I don't know why I'm looking at my watch it's up there the timing on this video and we'll be here again with the super long intros Danny I just cut the rest of your intro I'm sorry I'm sorry take note Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus no idea if that name is pronounced correctly and uh no are given. Ancient Rome, 458 BC. The simple farmer, Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus. Oh my god, it sounds so, it sounds fake. It's like Simon Maximus. <laughs> it's like, that's not a real name. He's toiling away on his land when he hears a faint knock on the door. Let's just call him LQC for short. <laughs> it's easier. So look, LQC, he's toiling away and uh, he's on the land and he hears a faint knock on the door of the farmhouse in the distance. His wife, Rasilia <laughs> is dealing with the unexpected visitors and just a few moments later she's calling out for her husband LC LQC come quickly LQC what now I'm busy these olive trees won't plant themselves it's those people from the senate again they say they need you to become dictator <laughs> what again I've already had my turn can't they try next door they say it has to be you LQC <laughs> off a 
God's sake, this bloody republic, it does my head in. The word dictator conjures up visions of a greedy, repressive leadership which rules by brutal force without the consent of the people living under a regime of fear, but the origins of the title didn't come packaged with any negative connotations. Dictators first showed up during the Roman Republic when the term was originally used to describe a person nominated by the Senate and appointed to the, to the Curiate Assembly to assume absolute control during a crisis. The interesting point is that these dictators were expected to stand down and return to power and return power to the Senate after a maximum of just six months. And that's exactly what all of them did for almost 500 years. Although in the case of LQC, he didn't like to hang about for more than a few weeks max. We're talking about ancient Rome here, and historians now question whether every element of the story is entirely accurate or embellished by legends. But the most commonly recounted version of events is described in Volume 3 of Livy's History of Rome. Cincinnatus, sorry, LQC, came from a wealthy background and briefly served as Rome's consul during a period uh, when there were growing unrest between the powerful patricians and the common plebeians who were fighting for new constitutional rights, which they didn't deserve. It has to be said that Cincinnatus was largely against the idea of common plebs being granted a fairer share of power. <laughs> what a sensible man. I just, we should just not, I honestly, I just poor people shouldn't be allowed to vote. But his angry son, Say Queso, had... <laughs> Sounds like a Mexican snack. Had much more violent feelings on the matter. He, after he killed a protesting plebeian, Queso fled Rome in shame and left her to comp the flag. LQC was held responsible for his son's actions, booted out of the Senate, and slapped with a fine so hefty that it drained all of his wealth and left him to live out the rest of his life working the fields on a modest farm. Or so he thought... Following his fall from grace, there was a knock on the farmhouse door just a few years later. In 558 BC, the Roman city of Tusculum found itself under invasion by the achy people, their achy bones, and the Senate had decided that the disgraced consul LQC was the only guy capable of dealing with the emergency. LQC put down his spade and took on the role of dictator, and although the odds were heavily against Rome, he swiftly raised an army to vanquish the invading achy forces in the Battle of Mount Algidius. Just 16 days after being appointed dictator, LQC felt that his work here was done, and he stepped down to return to his family and live out the rest of his life working the fields on his modest farm. Or so he thought! But 19 years later, in 439 BC, the men in robes were back knocking on his farmhouse door. This time, a wealthy plebeian by the name of Spurius Malius. <laughs> How did a plebeian get money? Should have been allowed that. He was hatching a plot to establish himself as the new king of Rome, and he was attracting a growing flock of loyal plebeian followers devoted to the cause. After being installed as dictator for a second time, Cincinnatus soon nipped this in the bud. Spurius quite rudely ignored a summons to appear before the now quite elderly Cincinnatus, and his punishment for this was getting hunted down and killed by the dictator's men. Just 21 days had passed before Cincinnatus again dropped the mic and buggered off back to the farm. The this time for good. Or so he thought, Danny, no! It's quite extraordinary to think that a dictator could hold absolute power over Rome twice and successfully tackle two potential catastrophes, yet his main priority afterwards was to return to his simple farming life as quickly as possible to support his wife and children. Maybe he just didn't like being dictator. It's not for everybody. I mean, I'd love it. I, You know, we talked about the palaces, right? But some dude would just be like, no, I just, okay, look, I'll solve the problem and then I'm going home. I just don't want to be here. I don't like you. I don't like being in charge. I don't like the responsibility. I want to go plant potatoes or whatever the fuck he's up to. And this legacy of LQC would go on to influence the US presidency. There are very few of the great dictators left. All the best ones are now gone. George Washington was hailed as a modern day LQC when he set precedent for voluntarily stepping down after serving two terms instead of desperately clinging to power for as long as possible. Funnily enough, he also largely retired to a farm in Mount Vernon. What? Uh, that, I guess. Okay, so look. But it's the past. Everyone was a farmer. <laughs> On a more worrying note for the UK, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson name-checked LQC during his resignation speech in 2022. No, 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 Boris. Don't be doing that, Boris. No one wanted you, Boris. You did all these sorts of parties and shit when you weren't supposed to, which was very hypocritical, and everyone was happy to see you leave. Everyone liked LQC. LQC was a legend. You're just a prick. <laughs> That's a bit harsh.
<laughs> but it was a douche move to have those parties, Boris. It's not a good look. He'd just been forced out following a long list of scandals and controversies and illegal cheese parties during COVID lockdowns. Just like LQC. Boris revealed that he had planned to return to his plow like LQC, and this was initially thought to mean that he planned to return to the humble life of a backbencher after serving at the front line of government. But it's now believed that this was a strong hint that he plans to come back. No one wants you back, Boris. You were a rubbish prime minister and we're glad you're gone. Lee Kuan Yew. Ah, oh, the Singapore dude. This guy might be one of the greatest dictators of the 20th century and poster boy for effective dictatorship over a long-winded democratic process. But was the prime minister of Singapore even a dictator at all? Lee Kuan Yew wouldn't agree with the description. After he co-founded the People's Action Party in 1954, he went on to become Singapore's first prime minister in 1959 with a fair election. The problem is that all the subsequent elections over his 31 year reign were a little more than just a bit dodgy. And any credible political opponents were either sued into bankruptcy or held in prison without charge or trial. <laughs> but it's not a dictatorship, <laughs> not at all. One of his more popular opponents ended up stuck in prison for 23 years on groundless accusations that he was an undercover communist agitator. Not a dictatorship, no, 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 I'm not a dictator. Not a dictator. You've got to have at least six palaces and only have five. Maybe Lee wasn't the nicest of guys, but dictators who were actually nice guys is a bit of a contradiction in terms. Is surely a genuinely nice guy would let the people decide every now and then if he was nice enough to stay in power. I don't think you have to... No, I disagree. I think you could be a dictator and still be, like, pretty chill. But look, while we're dissing Lee, there are many other controversial aspects to his dictatorship, aside from silencing his opponents and muffling the press. He was a big advocate of corporal punishment in the form of caning. <laughs> Nice guy! <laughs> Although, to be fair, this was a tradition inherited from the very recent British colonial rule. He was also pretty tough in his crackdown on antisocial behavior. Smoking, littering, spitting, and even chewing gum in public places were punishable with hefty fines. On a more extreme note, anyone caught trafficking relatively small amounts of drugs is automatically sentenced to death. <laughs> automatically makes it sound like a machine's doing it. It's like, bah, 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 death. <laughs> Uh-oh. You don't tend to get many drug problems in Singapore. Lee also implemented the highly controversial population control program under the banner Stop at Two. Mothers were given a reward of $5,000 if they agreed to be sterilized after the birth of their second child, whilst any mothers who went beyond the threshold were punished with shorter maternity leave, fewer economic rebates, and higher hospital charges. If anything, the campaign was a little too successful, and Lee eventually changed course to offer cash... Uh, and Lee eventually changed course to offer cash rewards to mothers who had three or more children but only if the mothers were educated that doesn't sound very nice uh what about the plebs lee however there's no denying that lee kuan yu was responsible for one of the most remarkable transformations of a country that the world has ever seen following british colonial rule and japanese occupation singapore was little more than an isolated poverty-stricken shanty town with no natural resources and a woeful economy lee led singapore out of colonial rule and into a bold new era of prosperity he attracted massive international investment by turning singapore into an industrialized workshop growing the economy eightfold the country evolved from an impoverished backwater into a nation with the third highest per capita income in the world i didn't realize it was that high that's high homelessness poverty and unemployment were close to eradicated while literacy levels and average life expectancy increased in short lee was widely hailed as a legend by his people for taking control of a racially divided dump and turning it into a proudly multicultural modern metropolis within the space of a single generation it's true the transformation of singapore is fucking remarkable even after stepping down as Prime Minister in 1990, he continued to serve in the government for another 25 years until his death in 2015. And his genes are still in power today. That's definitely not the side of a dictator handing it off to your relatives. <laughs> No, d dictators and nepotism, two totally separate things. Singapore's current prime minister is his son, Lee Hsien Long, who rose through the military and political ranks suspiciously quickly. Yeah, well, obviously. <laughs> but bearing in mind Lee Kuan Yew's massive popularity, it's perhaps surprising that he didn't just allow fair elections without muzzling his opponents. He could have been remembered as one of the greatest prime ministers of all time, instead of the slightly less flattering title of least brutal dictator in history. Thomas Sankara. Ah, now this final entry is my favorite dictator of all. Thomas Sankara was the president of the West African nation of Burkina Faso, and his tragically brief reign in the 1980s showed just how much a super cool dictator can achieve in a tiny window of time. Back when Thomas was serving in the Burkinabe military in the 1970s, the country was still known as Upper Volta, originally a French colony which had gained full independence by 1960. Thomas wasn't just a distinguished military captain, he was also a pretty good jazz guitarist. 
Okay, then. <laughs> he played in many different bands, including one called Toot Toot Aku Jazz, uh, which he formed with his good buddy Blaise Kambare, who would go on to be a key figure throughout the life of Thomas Sankara. Thomas was briefly given the role of Prime Minister of Upper Volta, serving under President Jean Baptiste. Or Drago, but Thomas often seemed at odds with the rest of the government, and his popularity with the public was beginning to get on the unpopular president's nerves. Thomas was dismissed and arrested, but not for long. His good buddy Blaise Campare was on board to bust Thomas out of jail and lead the second coup in less than a year. Great sign of stability of a country there. How many coups are you having a year? If it's anything more than zero, it's unstable. President Oradrara was ousted from power, and the National Council of the Revolution was formed, with Thomas Sankara as the new president, and good old Blaise Compare serving as deputy. One of the very first things that Thomas did was change the name of the upper nation from Upper Volta, which was associated with the French colonial regime, to Burkina Faso, which roughly translates to Land of the Honest People. He then composed a funky new national anthem for his funky new country. Please tell me it's a jazz guitar anthem. Please tell me this. This would be amazing. But here's one of the things I love most about Thomas Sankara. He immediately cut down on lavish spending habits of ministers and officials and banned them from claiming expensive to private chauffeurs and first-class airline tickets. He also slashed all of their salaries, as well as his own. That's a pretty hard thing to comprehend here in the UK, where British politicians continually insist that the extra money can't be found to give fair pay rises to striking nurses and teachers, yet still vote to give themselves a nice pay rise every year. <laughs> Yeah, 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 they shouldn't be deciding their pay. Some, there should be a separate group to decide their pay. And if they do a sh job, it should be less. <laughs> like Boris Johnson, they'd be like, claw back some of his salary. <laughs> your money or your life. Best of all, Thomas got rid of the fleet of flashy Mercedes cars, which have been the official vehicle for all government employees, and replaced each one with a shitty Renault 5, the cheapest car available in the country at the time. That's not a million miles away from the Pope downgrading his fabulous Pope mobile to a, C -cla a Sinclair C5. Thomas would have been far more likely to use his bike anyway. He was a man of very few possessions, owning nothing more than his Renault 5, a few cheap bikes, three guitars, a fridge, and a knackered freezer. He even refused to install air conditioning in his home until it was installed in every other home in Burkina Faso. And he also had a refreshingly small ego. Unlike most other African nations which hang portraits of their great leaders in public areas, Thomas felt that this was unnecessary on the grounds that there are 7 million Thomas Sankaras. But, oh, because it's like he represents his people. Yeah, this guy does seem pretty chill. Take a chill pill. What does that mean? It means you uh, relax, you know, if things are getting hated. But it's for the stuff that he did for the nation for which he is most remembered. Thomas redistributed farming land from feudal landlords to the peasants, creating a rise in wheat production which made the country entirely food self-sufficient without relying on foreign aid. He'd effectively solved hunger. He also vaccinated 2.5 million people to eradicate common diseases, planted millions of trees to prevent desertification, increased the literacy rate from 13 to 73 percent, promoted women's rights and appointed women to top positions for the first time, banned forced marriages, child marriages, genital mutilation, and a ton of other stuff beside thomas sounds like a f***ing legend to be honest let's have this guy as prime minister f it, let's just have him as dictator just go in there and sort that sh out thomas all in the space of just four years because that's all the time he had left not everyone was happy with their dictatorship particularly not those feudal landlords or those who felt the country should restore its relationship with france yeah that would have been a good idea what what did you miss colonialism <laughs> in 1987 thomas sankara was a san no was assassinated in a plot overseen by none other than his good buddy Blaise Compare, who went on to rule Burkina Faso for the next 27 years until he himself was ousted in 2014 and fled to the Ivory Coast like a little girl. During his time in power, Blaise Compare pretty much reversed the reforms that Thomas had implemented and drove the country back into debt and poverty. What a prick. He effectively unsolved hunger. Perhaps one of the reasons why Thomas Sankara is so fondly remembered is because he didn't have enough time to be corrupted absolutely by absolute power. Uh, or maybe he would never have been because he's such a legend. Oh, one critic joked that Thomas Sankara was one of those dictators who was lucky enough to die before he screwed things up. There has already been a few worrying signs of things turning sour with dubious trials of former government officials and the time that he sacked 2,500 striking teachers and tried to replace them with volunteers. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, Thomas Sankara still gets my vote as the most legendary rock star dictator in history. Not that he would have ever given me a chance to vote on anything, that cheeky dictatorial scamp. 
that's where we end today's video. Thank you for watching. Jahnoon, welcome, devils of the Zionist media, and the death to the West.